you know. And so we kind of had to grab the interview in between. Just, it, it reminded me of Carol Burnett. Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> oh, me. Okay. Patrick, whenever you say. Let me just get you guys talking a little bit. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, I'm hoping that we won't have background <laughs> extras. <laughs> oh, I was so sorry when Harvey Corman went on. I oh, loved him so much. You know, uh, I, I met him, um, I interviewed him one time that I remember, and there may have been some other little sightings from times, and they were uh, just beyond hysterical. <laughs> And it, it, one thing they did, they did the famous dentist thing, you know. <laughs> but, uh, okay, ready to go on the single shot of her. Georgia, it is so wonderful to have you back in Dallas. Thank you. I love coming here, Bobby. <laughs> and you're here with the drowsy chaperone. And uh, this is a, a musical that you've been involved with from almost its inception, haven't well, you? Well, not quite. I, I came into it with readings for them trying to make it happen in the United States in 2004, but they'd been working on it for eight years. It had been having an evolution for eight years before in Canada. It started out as a, a, a they don't call them a, a bachelor things. They call them deer and doe parties. <laughs> but for Bob Martin and his wife, they, they had a party together and his comedian friends put on a little sketch called the Rousey Chaperone. And this brilliant man took the, the little sketch worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, and over the years it became the Drowsy Chaperone, the Broadway musical. Isn't that interesting? Fascinating, you know, that that could be the genesis for I think that's, excuse me for interrupting, I think that's part of the success of the piece. So many of the shows on Broadway now are trying to follow formulas to be a success. And because this started from such a pure place as a gift, and then somebody liking it so much they wanted to write a part in there for, for a man in chair, which is what makes the piece so much fun. I think because it started from such a, a unusual place, not trying at the very beginning to be a Broadway smash. I, I, I think that's, don't you think it's the originality of the piece that makes it fun? When I came out last night, I said, I have never seen anything like it. <laughs> and I doubt that there will be anything to compare with it for a long, long time. It is so original. And uh, your character, now see, this is a big treat for us, besides having you back in Dallas, a big treat for us, Georgia, because um, you're, you created this role on Broadway, and we don't very often get the original cast coming through Dallas, although we get very good cast. But here you are, the creator of Mrs. Tottendale. <laughs> Tottendale, what a wonderful name. <laughs> Was she always called Mrs. Tottendale? Yes. yes. And uh, so. Do you know, on the opening night on Broadway, Michael Jenkins came to me and he said, I want you to come to Dallas. And I had no idea how it would ever work out. I had no idea. And I think it, it's so sweet because I, I love playing Dallas. and. Um, you know, this is, we're going on into our 10th month on the road, and and um, we just felt a special uplift last night. The audiences in Dallas are so enthusiastic and so warm, and and they help you do even better than you thought you could do. Do you know what I mean? It's such a sweet thing, so I'm really glad that I was able to fulfill um, Michael Jenkins' dream for the music hall for me to be able to come back. I had no idea I would ever do it. And he asked you before he read the reviews, huh? Oh, I, I don't read reviews, so I have no idea about that. He just knew that, <laughs> that he wanted me to come to the <laughs> music hall with Drowsy. You never read reviews, Georgia? Oh, I don't. 
Oh, I did as a young person. I, I just, um, I think you'll find a lot of, a lot of veteran actors. I, I haven't read them in 25 years. Um, in a long career, you get as many bad ones as, as good ones, and you begin to grow in spiritual maturity. You begin to look to a higher source than someone's opinion to, to find out your worth. And so I'm so deeply grateful when we get good reviews because I know it helps the theater and, and it helps the producers sell the show. Um, our director in our show doesn't read them either. Um, uh, it doesn't mean we don't appreciate the fine expertise of people that have spent a lifetime learning how to be critics. It's just um, you have to look to a higher, a deeper way of uh, um, the wonderful lady that uh, I rode with today said she had two big stars recently and she picked them up and she said they had the newspaper in their hands and they were fuming. And what a terrible way to go into an interview. I never had that problem, <laughs> whether it's bad, good, or indifferent. <laughs> I'm just happy to talk to somebody. But I, I think, um, I don't think it's helpful to actors. If, if it's real good, you get self-conscious. If it's not as good as you think it should be, <laughs> you, you're disappointed. And, um, I see the worth of them, but it's Im it's important for the other people to worry about that. The actors have to still give a hundred percent, whether it's appreciated what they're doing <laughs> or not. <laughs> when your fellow actors start to talk about reviews, do you just walk away? Some of the others don't either. Some of the more mature ones. When you're a kid, you want to read every little single thing that's written and you quickly get over that. <laughs> <laughs> you have worked with some of the grand dames of the theater, of musical theater, and I'm wondering if there's any particular person who's been a role model for you and your work and your career. Well, it, do you know, even though I'm not anything at all like them, both Ethel Merman and Mary Tyler Moore were tremendous role models for me by the way, their work ethic. Both of them were always the first one to the theater or to the television set and the last ones to leave at night and were so completely involved. I don't mean by being a Budinsky, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, very much engaged and when people were doing scenes they were in, they were still very interested and, and, and cared. And, um, uh, in, in, I so admire the youth and energy and um, enthusiasm that the young people put in their work today, but nowadays I don't even recognize the work ethic. People leave the show all the time, just have a personal day. It's like a business. They just, you're allowed to just put in, can I have a personal day or I want to be out for a week. I did a year with Ethel Merman, and both she and I were the only ones that never missed. And I just quietly picked up. She didn't want to m disappoint the people that were coming to see her. And, and the same with Mary. You couldn't do the show without the star <laughs> of the show. And um, um, I guess I just haven't made that transition of thinking it about it as just a business that so many of the young people do. When, when I was on Broadway, when our darling Sutton Foster, big Broadway star, she was out a lot. Just, just you know, if she didn't feel she was up to doing her best, she just was out. And she got married and was away, and it would take just time off. and. The only reason I'm saying that because her talent is so phenomenal and I love her so much and we go home on the bus together after the show and she tried to hide her little doggy. I love her so much and she like goes from one Broadway show to another but because she's grown up in a different era she thinks nothing of taking the time off and the audiences are just so disappointed when they come wanting to see her. You hear it and they go, 
Oh, you know, and and um, uh, did you ever read Lin, uh, um, Lenten Fontaine's um, biography? Um, they they felt that it was important for people that did bro Broadway to go around the country, and and share Broadway caliber stuff all around the country. And I read this when I was in my early 20s, and it made an impression on me. And it is a privilege to do something you've done in New York, to bring it around to people that might not ever get to Broadway. Well, we yeah. appreciate it very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm fortunate I do get to Broadway from time to time. But, well, it's um, important for you in what you do. Yes, uh, it kind of goes with the territory, <laughs> and, and I'm glad to say it does. But um, many people in this area who are uh, very devoted fans of the Dallas musicals uh, don't, for one re reason or another, get to New York. So you're a special treat for them this time. Thank you. <laughs> At any time in your career, did anyone try to get you to change your voice? Yes, when I first came to New York and I was in Hello, Dolly, as little mini Faye, I started taking an acting class from, um, what's the great method of uh, acting teacher's name? Actor Studio. Actor Studio, one of, one of the prodigies from that. And the training was so, and I had majored in drama at the University of Hawaii. The training um, was so foreign to the joy that was in me. They, this this particular acting teacher wanted to break you down and and um, and wanted to completely change me, which was perfectly legitimate. Had I been going into a different field, then I think I was meant. I very very happy with what I've done. And I know sometimes interviewers don't realize how rude it is, but they say, aren't you tired of, of just doing comedy for your whole life? And, and uh, you're not tired of it if you have a feeling that that's what you are meant to be doing. The, the joy of sharing laughter with people, there's nothing greater than that. And of course, it is, it's no secret that comedy is harder requires more skill and and better timing. Uh, I, I have the utmost respect for people who do comedy because I have seen so many people try it and they just don't cut it. <laughs> um, you. you have an understudy, I'm sure. I do. I and, do. and does she try to play it I, exactly as you play I it? Did, I, I only had to miss one performance when I had to do the Oprah Winfrey show a few weeks ago, and I had declined because it was in Boston. It was going to be in Boston on the weekend, and I didn't want to. Boston's like playing Dallas. That's <laughs> a really big venue. <laughs> you know, we really wanted to do it, and so I had declined. And then I heard back later, three and a half weeks later, my agent called and said they won't take no for an answer. But how about if we they change the date? So you. So I flew in on my day off and did it on Tuesday and um, uh, only missed one performance. And our darling understudies each cover four to six parts. So I don't even know how they do it. They're so brilliant. And the young woman who, who covers my part also covers Drowsy Chaperone. Well, those two parts are light years <laughs> apart light years apart, you know. One has to sing brilliantly and the other, it doesn't even matter what she sounds like. Um, so I have utmost respect for them, but I actually, because I wasn't there, I don't know how it was done. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the Oprah Winfrey show because um, that was just such a delightful show to watch. And um, uh, as, as you all gathered together, how long had it been since all of you were together in one place? It had been about a year and a half. We, they had brought us all together um, for the Screen Actors Guild Awards of 2006, I think it was. Or it might have been the fall of, or the early, 
like March of 2007. I'm sorry, I don't have the dates exactly in my head, but we had enjoyed being together then. But um, I haven't seen that. Somebody has given me a DVD of it. We were traveling from Greenville to Houston on the day that it aired, so I didn't get to see it. But um, I guess you, you, you remember they recreated the sets. Only on Oprah would anybody have the money to re recreate the sets. They didn't have any floor plans or contractors designs or anything. They did it from just watching the sh old shows. And, and it must have been 45 of her crew that they put it together. Don't you think that's remarkable to put something together that's just going to be destroyed the next day? It's a great tribute to <laughs> a show that is just part of Americana. So a great tribute to all of you. Did you know, uh, uh, were that you was surprised? A surprise? They showed it to us just before we went on the air because they didn't want us to drop dead or <laughs> <laughs> with a surprise. <laughs> that you got caught in a time warp. <laughs> Georgia, you are the most delightful person to talk with. You're just an interviewer's dream. And when I heard that you were coming back in this show in this show I was very very delighted I was uh, just gleeful thank you Bobby you know I love to talk to you anytime <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> we'll just he's going to turn the camera around and I'll release is this for somebody else it's or for, for you? me uh, Bobby is B-O-B-B-I-E yeah no it's for me I'm going to be very selfish. With uh, um, Alan Burns. Some days I have to sleep very fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everything, you're, you're happy? Thank All right, you. okay. And uh, rolling. Mm -hmm. We don't often get to have the star who created the role on Broadway, so why did you subject yourself to a tour, a 10-month tour? Well, I think it's a wonderful privilege, <laughs> and also I was glad to have work. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember my same answer no, twice. No, you don't have to okay. worry about that. Um, when did you first know, or when were you first invited to uh, join this cast? Uh, let me say it a different way. When did you first know that you would be doing the road tour? Well, it, it was four months after I had finished the, my year on Broadway. Okay. Um, I want to get something in about Michael Jenkins. Um, oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, but that'll fit, won't it? If, yes. Uh, when did you first know, and then you can say Michael came to you opening or, uh, night. Or you could ask me, did I have any idea I'd ever be doing oh, the okay. tour of it? Oh, okay. All right. Did you ever have an idea that you would be doing the national tour? Well, that's a good question. I actually didn't know how it would happen, but on the opening night, Michael Jenkins said, I want to see you in Dallas. And I wondered how that would ever happen, and here it finally happened. That's perfect. That's perfect. OK. Um, let's see. What is the joy of doing your character? Oh, <laughs> I guess it's just it, it's just the sheer silliness of it. And I have a wonderful comedy partner that I love playing with. Uh, you have worked with some of the grand dames of theater. Are any of them role models for you? Yes, yes, I consider Ethel Merman and Mary Tyler Moore my wonderful mentors. <laughs> Why do you list Ethel Merman and Mary Tyler Moore as your role models? Well, I worked with them when I was very, very young, and I just, their example was an example to me of, of, of giving your all in the work. How has the musical theater business changed since you got into it as a very young actress? Well, when, when um, I started, um, there were no vacations. We did a year without a vacation. And, and you only were out if you were sick. 
and, that's, that's and now good. people are out all the time. <laughs> that's good. Okay. Um, at any time, did did anyone ever try to get you to change your voice? Yes, they did, and I remember I didn't give you a good answer on that one. They, did, I got sidetracked. They did, but I ended up knowing I wanted to do what I do <laughs> instead of be Lady Macbeth. <laughs> Okay, one moment. Let me see if I overlooked anything. I wish the camera was on you when you said that nice thing about comedy. Oh, okay. I, I, I will say it then. Um, oh, okay. Um, I, I had said I don't mind doing, I love doing comedy. It, it's, it doesn't seem limiting to me. And, and, and you said. But everybody knows that comedy's much harder to do than anything else in the theater. So that's good. All right. How long had it, oh, no, let me change it. When Oprah had you all together recently, what was the most surprising thing to all of you about that show? Oh, they, they completely rebuilt the sets. <laughs> they had the, uh, Mary's apartment and, uh, and uh, Lou Grant's office. <laughs> they completely built them. <laughs> okay, that'll take care of us. It's fine. Thank you, Patrick. Thank wonderful. You. Just wonderful. You